Welcome, everybody. My name is John Baker. I direct the gallery here. And um, I'd like to welcome you to uh, the third in our uh, exhibitions this semester. Um, <clears throat> our artist tonight, <clears throat> well, actually, there's a couple of things before that. So this is Art Visit Day, or actually the Trinity Arts Experience. So we have a number of guests who are going to be joining us for the evening, and then tomorrow we're going to head downtown to see a, uh, a design studio by, uh, that's owned by a bunch of uh, Trinity graduates who were here in 2001 and 2002 and 2004. Uh, we'll also go to the gallery district, so that's all kind of exciting. Um, <clears throat> and then later tonight is SARS, um, the student annual review show, which was the brainchild of 2004 senior Adam Friend, who decided that he wanted to get to know the freshmen. And he also thought it'd be a really good idea for freshmen to have to stand up in front of a huge group of people and talk about their art. <clears throat> um, so that's going to be, uh, after the lecture, the, there will be a reception. And SARS will probably start around 7.40, 7.45-ish. Is that about right? <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> Maybe closer to 8. 8.30. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, they get 60 seconds. If they go over 60 seconds, we will gong show you unceremoniously off the stage. <clears throat> uh, it's great fun. And there will be pizza, so <clears throat> stick around. <clears throat> um, all right, so for tonight's artist, uh, this is Sergio Gomez. Or you can see him, another copy of him up here. Uh, I was looking from down the hall. I thought, I'm seeing double again. Um, uh, and um, Sergio uh, runs a gallery downtown, uh, Art Next Level, at the Jou B Center. Um, he also is an artist, as you know, from the work in the gallery. He has shown all over the world. His, uh, his work is in collections from Italy to Mexico to Chicago and a whole bunch of other places. And if you really want to see all of that stuff, there is an extensive resume uh, with the uh, title sheet uh, in the gallery. Um, and if I remember right, you did your graduate work at Northern Illinois and your undergraduate at? Governor State. Governor State, all right. So, local boy makes good. <laughs> all right, and Sergio, welcome to Trinity. Well, thank you everybody. How are you doing today? Sorry, I don't like, I don't like to be uh, too far out from, the, from everybody. So uh, I'm really excited to be here. I want to thank John for the invitation uh, when he invited me to come and to have the show. And then to talk to students, this is the part that I enjoy the most. You know, the art is there, it's fine, it's cool. <laughs> but to, to come and see students and to talk to, to people, you know, I'm, I'm all about community. That's really what matters. That's really what pumps me up. The show is kind of like, it's great, but this is for me the highlight of the night. So. Uh, of course, if you want to see the show, it'd be, gr it'd be great to see you there too. <laughs> uh, so I titled my, my talk really quickly, which is an overview of my art career, Seven Tweetable Truths I Have Learned in 45 Years. And I picked 45 years because that's how long I've been around. And next, next week is my 46th birthday. So I'm like, this is the last time I have a chance to publicly say I'm 45. So <laughs> after that, at, at 46, I don't think I've, it will look as good. <laughs> so, right. So here's the first one, right away. First truth I have learned, to dream is to live twice in one life. And this I really, really, really believe. Since I was a kid, I've been a dreamer. I, I dream things. I To this day, sometimes I wake up and I tell my wife, I have an idea. And she's like, too early, tell me later, <laughs> you know? And it's like, but I have to tell somebody. You know, and, and these are things that I think as artists, probably you will uh, identify with, you know, we are dreamers and, and we make something visible out of something that wasn't here the day before. And that's just an amazing experience. And um, so as an artist myself, like all of you here, you know, really when you think about it, to dream is to live more than once, you know, because dream, to dream is, is free, doesn't cost anything, 
and and it's just an amazing experience. So never stop dreaming. Uh, even at 46, pretty soon, I still dream. Uh, really quickly, I was born in Mexico. S in Mexico, I lived in Mexico City until I was 16. Uh, and my my dad and my mom they were um, ministers. Uh, so I was a pastor's kid living in Mexico City. And uh, although Mexico City had about 20 million people, I never met, in my first 16 years, I never met a living artist. All the artists, all the art I saw were all dead people, you know, like Diego Rivera's work and Frida Kahlo. They were all gone by the time I was 16. And, uh, you know, I, I never met an artist. So I never thought that actually having an art career was something that you could actually do. You know, I, I thought you had to be dead, you know, in order to do that. But, uh, you know, I kept dreaming about it. <laughs> uh, that's the main thing. Uh, so here's really quickly, in 1988, my, my dad uh, moved from Mexico City to the Chicagoland area, specifically those of you who are familiar with the area, to Joliet area, uh, because there was a Spanish-speaking church here that was starting, and so the, the denomination sent my dad here. So I was 16. I didn't want to come because at 16, you don't want to go anywhere. You know, because you got your friends, and just like, no matter how pretty it is on the other side, you love where you're at. And that's what I was. So I came here in 1990, uh, as soon as I finished high school. I didn't, my English was still very poor, didn't know exactly what to do, but I had an amazing art high school teacher who said, you know what, you like art, you might as well, you know, go for it. He said, well, I don't even know how to fill out my application for college. So he helped me out, went to Yale Junior College, was there for two years, transferred to the School of the Institute of Chicago, Loved it, but I couldn't afford it. It was too expensive. My parents had no money. You know, pastor's kids, you know, they were, had no luck. So I had a one-year ride scholarship, but that was it. You know, after that, I just couldn't afford it. And, of course, you know, I still didn't know the, the system, how to apply for scholarships, how to look for funding. I just couldn't do it. So I looked for an alternative and went to Governor State University. And uh, that's where I completed uh, my Bachelor of Arts and then my Master of Arts. And it was there that I also met my wife. So actually it was a good thing that I didn't have money <laughs> to stay at the Art Institute. <laughs> Sometimes no money is the best thing that can happen to you. Um, so here's the thing, you know, when, when you move from one place to another, whether it's a, a country to a country or city to city or, you know, sometimes just roommate to roommate, you know, you, you face things having to do with identity, you know, who you are, what people expect from you, uh, what, what are the, the, the things that, that you are all about? And those were the first things that I started to explore in my art when I came here into this country. You know, this idea of who am I? So this is, this is work that I did when I was in undergrad and at school. You know, a lot of uh, images that had to do with my culture, you know, kind of I miss my culture. I miss the things that were happening in my culture. So a lot of my art had to do with kind of exploring uh, you know, what I had left behind, which is something that's very common when you look at art by immigrants. You know, a lot of the times their first years is about, you know, who am I? You know, what am I doing here? You know, why am I here? And asking those questions that are so relevant uh, to ourselves. And so I loved school. I loved art school. This was one of the things that I think one of my, some of my happier years were in school. You know, had the greatest time, uh, had made some uh, excellent friends and professors. Uh, who were really mentors to me, and, and I just had a, a wonderful time. I remember, you know, those were the days where cell phones were not around. Uh, there was no internet, so you had to really talk to people. And uh, it, was, it was also a time in which, um, uh, y you know, y the, you didn't have as many bills as you have now. Like, you know, you kids, you have a, a nice phone. You got to pay for the phone. So you got to do a lot of work to pay for the stuff that you have. Back then, you know, the only thing you could that was expensive were like tennis shoes, like Jordan shoes and stuff like that, you know? And, uh, but my friend and I, you know, we never had Jordans. We never had anything expensive. We just love going into the studio early in the morning, stay at the school all day long, find whenever there was a free opening that, or wherever there was a, an event from other faculty that they had leftover food so we could go and eat that up, you know, that was our dinner. And then probably some of you might, uh, might do the same here, you know, a typical college thing. You know, you walk by, ooh, there's food there. That <laughs> you just kind of walk in, you know, you have nothing to do with the event, but you know, there's the food. Like I heard pizza, so you'll see me here <laughs> in a little bit. Th those things don't ne never go away. Um, so I was, I was really uh, enjoying it, and I, I really fell in love with the medium of painting. Although I tried printmaking and computer art and, and such things, painting was to me like, 
my uh, that what, it was my thing, you know, it was what I found my moment. And not only painting, but then I also discovered uh, digital art. Back then, Photoshop was like a very early version of Photoshop. And, uh, you know, I, I started to enjoy both things, you know, the, the digital world, uh, which was nice and neat and clean in the, uh, in the digital lab, and then walking into the art studio like that, you know, and all messy. And, you know, they were I love those. I, I love uh, contradictions, and I love uh, kind of uh, things that are opposite to each other. Um, the parallels of things. Uh, so uh, as I continue to work with painting, I also discovered large size painting, you know, which again, I was reading a lot about the Mexican muralist. You know, again, I was very inspired by my culture. Uh, it's funny, like, it, you know, when you are in, in your world or where you're at in your city, you never notice things that otherwise when you leave, you miss them. It's like, wow, you know, when I left Mexico, that's when I was really interested in Mexican culture and Mexican history. When I was in Mexico, I hated, you know, every class <laughs> of arch or history class of, of Mexican culture, you know. But when you leave, those are the things that you really, really look for and really look behind. So a lot of my work, again, continue that. So this, for example, is a mask. It's an Aztec mask. The, and around this time, 1994, was kind of like the first time where I also wanted to use my body uh, as part of the art making process. And kind of like this, uh, going to this, this idea of as a little kid, I remember, you know, and probably you all have done that when you were kids, uh, that you put your hand and then you trace your, you trace your hand and then you make little art with that, you know. We all have done it as kids and, and it's a way of kind of registering, you know, who we are and as we grow, you know, that little hand now, it's, it's a big hand. And so I started to use my body and so in paintings like this, I would pose I would paint against the wall. This is a life-size painting. So the figures that you see here, this person is life-size, is my size. So I would like, literally like put the chair, sit down, and then just trace around myself with a marker. And uh, I, I would do it uh, like after hours in, in the studio. This is at school. After all the other classmates had left because they would make fun of me, you know, if I, if I was doing that in front of everybody. But uh, I, I found... I discovered that was a way for me to kind of uh, feel more connected to the art that I was making. Again, because it was all about identity and about who I was and about the things that were, were uh, meaningful to me. Uh, at the same time, I, I you know, discovered the, the idea of space and depth, that, that the involvement of the viewer when they approach a large painting and also giving even within a large work giving a lot of detail so that people would get close to it and find nuances and find little details or words or pictures or things that otherwise five feet away you would not see it unless you were like a, a feet away from the work. And I really enjoy that. And I think one of the things I, I, I like that about is that, um, you know, again, back, this is 1990s, early 90s, there was no GPS. So when you had to go somewhere, you would take a map, right? And if those of you who remember that, you know, you would take the map from the, from the car and uh, you will unfold it and you could never fold it back again the same way it was. <laughs> and, you know, you couldn't ask Siri to give you directions. Siri wasn't born back then. <laughs> and so it was, it was one of those things that uh, my dad was driving and I was always the one giving the directions. So I was the one opening the map and go turn left, turn right. Uh, so I, I saw my work almost like a map, you know, because when you think about identity, it's about search, right? It's about a search for who you are, for the things that matter to you. And so I started to think about my art as almost a map and, and the fragility of a map. The more you use it, the more worn out it gets, uh, the, the more valuable as well in terms of, you know, that's your map that you've been using forever. And so you may have some markings and things. So, and so as I started approach painting more in that sense, that's why I got less and less interested with stretching my work. And even in the show that you see here, you know, 20 some years later, I still, all the work that you see there is roll. It's, it's just, it just hangs freely, almost like a map, you know, that you can roll. I love the fragility of the, of the object and, and the war now ages as uh, paintings go from show to show. Uh, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> you helped me hang the show, and we were not like super careful, right? <laughs> we were somewhat, but you know, if 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 it's a little bit off here and there, it's okay. You know, it's it's part of 
It's part of the life of the work as it travels, as it coexists with other communities. And just like a map, you know, uh, which help us navigate from one thing to another. Um, so here are other pieces. Uh, not only I started to explore my identity, but also my, my beliefs and uh, you know, the idea of spirituality in one's life. Those were also important values that my parents had really invested in me since I was a little kid. I mean, I always say when people ask me, where did you start your, you know, being an artist? I always say, I started at church. And not because I was doing art in the front, but because my mom to keep me quiet since we were always at church as a pastor's kid, she would give me paper, like here, paper and pen, keep yourself busy. And that's how I started really uh, becoming an artist, you know, as a little kid, just trying to stay busy and not, not being rowdy or noisy inside of the church. That came later. Uh, here's another word. This is one of like my first really large piece that I did. I did a lot of research. This is 1995. I was still a governor state, and you know, I did a lot of research on on artists' uh, interpretations of the Last Supper theme. So I always wanted to do my own Last Supper in my own style. So uh, in one summer, I took a summer class, and I I asked my ast my art teacher, the only thing I want to do this summer is do a Last Supper. If you give me a big wall like that, I'll do the Last Supper life size. And the teacher said, okay, go ahead, do it. So that's all I did that summer, day, day after day, just working on it. And this is the, the finished piece. Right now it's hanging, it's on loan at the Chicago um, Theological Union in, uh, in Hyde Park. And it's a life-size, life so you know, a little bit shorter than that wall. Uh, so for this piece too, I had to, I had to pose for each of the characters. So it was almost, almost like a play as well, like reenacting the Last Supper as me taking the place of each of the characters. Um, as you might guess, Judas, the one on the left, you know, or your right, who is kind of uh, uh, turning away from it. And the whole, the whole uh, idea behind this piece is, uh, you know, I saw the, the Last Supper as an image of community. And I've always thought that Community is one of the most valuable things that I, that I can have access to in this world. And so a community there, uh, the table symbolizes kind of like this world, and on the bottom is like our search of power, uh, and the sh you know how because of that search we cannot destroy each other, and this idea of community doesn't quite take place as it should be. Uh, here you can see a shot of the, of the work and how it would look in life size. So 1997, got married, happy face. <laughs> and uh, my wife is there, Dr. Yaina Gomez. 1999, I began a career in graphic design. Those, those things, you know, like, okay, I got married. Uh, we, were, we met at school, and it's like, okay, I guess I need a job, right? I, I guess we got to do something. So because I loved design, and I had always been taking graphic design courses, that was kind of like the logical thing for me. So I started working in graphic design, working in an advertising company and a printing company as well. And, but something happened here, and that's why I have an empty slide. This is when just art just sometimes goes bad. You know, This was a period in my life that was really hard for me because I was working nine to five, supposedly, but it was more because, you know, as in graphic design field, it's all about deadlines and you work hard and advertising companies, they're, they're the worst in, in that and they suck the life out of you, right? And it was like, so I don't have time to make art, only in the weekends, in my garage, and every art I made, I hated. I completely hated it. And I, my wife remembers that sometimes I would make a painting and then she would come in the, in the, stu in the garage, you know, like, Three days later, it's like, where'd it go? It's like, I just painted over it. I hate it. And she's like, no, that was my favorite one. So, sorry, you know, I hate it. And so I went for a, co you know, I don't know how long it was, but, you know, for a time in which I just hated everything I made. But I kept making it. And, and, the, and that's the key, you know. Even when you go through a dry period, you keep making it. You know, you go in the studio sometimes and things are just going bad. You just go and just keep making it. Because uh, here's where, here's the key where most of my friends in art school stay. They stayed as weekend artists, painting when they had a little bit of time here and there, and they never made it past this because they stopped making. So that's the lesson, uh, never stop making. So here's another tweetable. Number two, sorry, it's a little bit longer, but it's still within the 144. Uh, 
break the glass of failure and pull the extinguisher of procrastination, build something new out of the ashes of disappointment. And this is truly, I believe, you know. They ha I came to the point, like, and, and I have this visual of, you know, every building has, a, I don't know where it's on this building, but there's a, a glass where the extinguisher is in the, behind the glass, right? In order to get to the extinguisher, you gotta break the glass so you, so you can really extinguish the fire. So it's the same thing, you know, in order for me to get out of this bad season of no, of bad art, I had to break the glass, you know, of, of this bad art that I was making and pull the extinguisher and say, that's enough, enough procrastination, enough of not doing something and then build something new out of that. So uh, that's my second thing I've learned. So, um, things changed. 2001, my first son, Alec, was born. That changed my life completely. You know, you see a new person that, that's just there, and you know it's, it's yours, and it changes your life. You know, you're like, what am I going to do the rest of my life? Uh, so, we made a decision, my wife and I, say, okay, I'm going to enroll and do my MFA, complete my MFA. So, I went back to school, because I knew school... I believe in education. I wanted to complete my MFA, get to the end of uh, of my uh, education. And so we, we took a turn and said, okay, I'm gonna go back to school now. And then when I'm done, then she went back after to get her doctorate. And I had to work uh, full time in Monster, Indiana, eight hours a day, start really early, skip lunch, get off early and drive all the way to Northern three times a week. I did that for two years and a half. And uh, so when my students, cause I teach now, when my students come in and say, oh, Mr. Gomez, I have a job. I said, well, you know, I did have one too. <laughs> and I had to skip weekends and not eat, you know, eat on the car and a lot of Red Bull before cell phones were around. And it's doable, you know. You just have to have the, the, um, the focus and really the, the desire to do it. So, of course, when I went back to school, I was back in the community of artists. So I started to create work. And I, for the first time in a in long time, I started to get excited about my art again. And I started to create new work. So these are some of the works that were created in that period. Show you some of them like that. And here's another dream that I had from the longest time since I was, I think that started when I was at the Art Institute of Chicago. One day, you know, I'm like, you know, I would love to one day open up an art gallery. And that was a dream that I had, and, and you know, I never forgot about it. So the time came in 2004 when I was finishing my MFA, and, and I talked to my wife, like, you know, I really had this dream of always wanted to open up another gallery, so I think this is the time now. I didn't know anything about running a gallery. I didn't know anything about business. I didn't know anything about anything. I just wanted to, to do it and to start it. So I called three friends of mine because I didn't have any money to... <laughs> you know, to start a business, and said, hey guys, you know, do you want to start a co-op, you know, a co-op gallery with me, and let's just find space. So, so we got together one day, we, I remember we went for lunch, we drew up some sketches for, and ideas for logos and for names, we call it 33 Collective Gallery, not because there were 33 artists, but because when we couldn't figure out a name, we are like, well, all of us were 33 years old, and that's what, <laughs> you know, that was the only common thing, so. Th that's the only thing we could agree on in terms of the name. So uh, we call it the Electric Collective Gallery. And so we're like, okay, we need space. So I started looking for space, and I found uh, through a friend that I called, and I asked her, you know, I'm looking for space in Chicago to open both my studio and an art gallery. Is, do you know of anything? She's like, yeah, there's this place in Bridgeport, south side of Chicago. It's a huge building, uh, 80,000 square foot, that the Joe Brothers just bought. And... To me, that name, Joe Brothers, meant something special because I, I don't, I, that's a completely different lecture that I do, but um, when I was in school, I went to the um, to Navy Pier to see the Expo Chicago back then in the 80s when it was really big, and the I remember seeing two Chinese artists doing this giant painting in the, at the pier, in the outside of the pier, and I was like, amazed by it and I purchased the catalog I didn't know who they were and and I put that catalog with that page of the Joe Brothers in my studio for many years so I was familiar with the name uh, but I didn't know them I, I had no idea and so when my friend said that Joe Brothers purchased this building I was like that those are the two Chinese guys who made these giant paintings and they become very famous she's like yeah that's them like well I'm a student you know I, they don't, 
you know, why would they want me to go there? So she said, just go, call this number, and, and just do it. So I did. I called the number. I was so scared. And one of them picked up the phone, and, you know, um, and, you know, I said, you know, I'm looking for space. And my friend Ruth told me that, you know, to you guys just purchase this building. She said, that he's like, one of them said, yeah, come and, come and see it. So I went, and this is how it looked when we first saw the building. All uh, dirty and just open, huge warehouse space, four floors of nothing but, but garbage. And um, I fell in love with it. And they gave, they gave me, in a few words, you know, the vision of what they had for this place, a place for artists, a community for artists. And to me, that was like Kool-Aid. You know, it's like, yes, you know, I can see it. This is what I've been dreaming about as well. So we rented a small space here with my friends, and that's how 33 Collective began. So uh, here's uh, the, the Joe Brothers, and um, Carla, my friend, and Javier, uh, and myself, and Kim, so the other one over there, who we started 33 Collective. And it was just a collective. We started just showing our, our, our art, and then our friends from school, and then friends of our friends. You know, as the circle, the circle began to go larger, we started to do third Fridays and inviting more people, and people started to come every third Friday of the month to this huge empty warehouse where just a few guys were opening space. We were the very first ones in the building. And uh, here's another lesson. It's not tweetable. I didn't make my slide for that, but always keep in touch with your professors, you know. Those are great resources. Those are great people who are always have your best interest. And that's my professor from college. And, and to this day, she's one of my best friends. Um, so, you know, as, as I continue to run the gallery, continue to run my art practice, continue to work with the figure. So it's been many years that I've been working with the figure. And, but the figure is not a portrait. It's not a portrait of me. It's not a portrait of a person. It's, it's a silhouette type of thing. It's an image that we can all identify with no matter who we are, no matter of our, you know, of our um, uh, perceptions that we might have about another person's culture or appearance. A figure of the essence of a, of a person uh, to me is very important. And that's when I understood that my art began to be about the cycle of life, you know, from the cycle from birth to death and, and what it means uh, to be alive and, and what it means to exist. The way I like to think about, you know, what I try to do in my work is this idea of presence. And it's like, this is how I put it. It's like, you know, when you are in a room all by yourself, maybe you're in your dorm and you're working, studying, and then maybe your roommate walks in the door, but you don't hear him, but you just feel that somebody walked in the door, right? And you're like, whoa, you scared me, man. You know, that kind of feeling that somebody has that presence that's there, even then when you don't see the person, but you can feel it, that's exactly the type of thing that really, really interests me when I make my art. And so my work is about that. It's about the presence of, uh, of our humanity. Uh, the work on the right, which is your left, uh, has now been featured among other pieces uh, and extensively written about by uh, Dr. Cecilia Gonzalez Andrew in the Walk Bridge to Wonder. So over the years, it's been really interesting to me to see how some of these pieces, even though they're older, they still continue to to give uh, and to and to bring about uh, you know something meaningful to other people. So in 2005, my second of two kids was born, my daughter Naya, and uh, I made this painting for her. Uh, it's called Meditation in Red, and it's a little butterfly. Again, that's her presence. Um, you know, there's some I always wanted a, a girl too. You know, besides the boy, but the, the you know, girls are so so girly and 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 you know, they give you kisses and you know, it's it's it's, it's very touching. You know, for a guy who likes community and and personhood, you know, that's special. And uh, so, and she's a little artsy in the house too. Now she also moved into my studio. She has a little studio. Started in a little corner, it's getting bigger, so I think I'm gonna have to look for a studio pretty soon <laughs> for me. <laughs> uh, so in 2006, we, you know, so many people were coming to the gallery, we expanded, we opened 33 and a half gallery and then 33 annex, so I was running three spaces simultaneously with shows every month, and it was just crazy, and it was, it was really fun, learned a whole lot, uh, and that's uh, another, Tweetable number three, convert big ideas into manageable small actions if you want to see them come to life. You know, you can have big dreams, but unless you do little steps every day, those dreams just stay as dreams. You know, 
I would still be dreaming about a gallery. How did I make the phone calls? How did I, you know, look on how to open a space? How did I, you know, do the things every day, little thing, little step that gets you closer to the larger goal, to the larger idea. And so that's another big truth I have learned over the years. So 2007, I started teaching at South Suburban College, finished my MFA. Uh, I was fortunate to find uh, a teaching position at South Suburban, which was close from home, close from the gallery. It was, it was the best. So I've been there since, and, and I love to teach with my students. In 2007, I was so busy and doing so many things that I got sick, like super sick. One day I was driving to school, got dizzy, really dizzy, ended up in the hospital with a uh, severe case of vertigo. And that's after that, that's when I made this painting. That's how I was feeling, you know, like things were twisting and turning around. So what I learned here is that when life gives you lemons, just make art, you know. You just That's what we artists do. We make art out of our experiences, right? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, sometimes those things, that the things that that are really true to you are the things that people see. This painting sold pretty quickly after I made it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very special to me in that way. Uh, some of the works, again, uh, over the years. So you can see the progression of the work. Uh, something that I'm very passionate about is also immigration. And uh, I read an article in 2008 about the kids that die in crossing the border with their parents. And I was really touched by that because by then I already had kids. So I did a drawing. And out of the drawing then came this large painting that I did life-size with two kids running towards the viewer, right as if they're being chased by the, by the helicopter at the borderline. And this is a piece that has become, again, one of the most, probably the most reproduced and most uh, written about on, on, in my trajectory as an artist thus far. This piece is right now on a, a national tour uh, through the United States all this year, 2017. It comes back to me early 2018. And, and it's a piece that speaks about, you know, what's happening, you know. As I put my kids to bed, you know, to think about that there are other kids that are, you know, are going through, through harm's way, that are going through things that are really, really difficult, not only in immigration but around the world, you know. It's, it's something daunting, something that touches me as a person and as an artist. Uh, in the, these are some of the details that you see because, again, like I said, it's a large painting, but I love to work with details. I like to provide a lot to the viewer, whether they see it as a distance in the gallery or if they get close to it and see it in proximity. Um, so here's 2010, again, the work continues to evolve. Sometimes I go into periods of a lot of color and sometimes I go into periods of black and white, kind of muted uh, periods in my work. Again, it, it changes quite considerably uh, over time. Sorry, I'm trying to find a good way to hit this. So in 2010, uh, I uh, had the opportunity to, by then the Art Center has started to grow, I had the opportunity to do a, a large curatorial, my, kind of like my, my uh, biggest uh, curatorial opportunity that I had up to that point. And it was, you know, the, I was given the opportunity to curate a big show in the bigger space in the Art Center. And so it was one of those ideas, again, that I woke up early in the morning to my wife, I had this idea for this show. It's going to be called Wet Paint. And became a national wet paint MFA now become a, has become a biennial. So in 2018 will be the next one. Where my vision was to look at all the universities in the United States that, that uh, have an MFA program and, and look at their top painting students and bring them to Chicago for a show. Uh, not really a contest, but more of a of show recognizing what's happening around the United States in terms of painting, why artists continue to, to use painting as a medium uh, of inspiration, and uh, here's a quick video about that. Well, wet paint began pretty much uh, after the idea of ten, we were 10 years after the new millennium, and people like my age, you know, we have lived. When we were kids, we thought of the year 2000 as being something so far away, but now we had just lived it. You know, now, uh, with all this technology that we have around to communicate uh, and interact around the world through Facebook, Twitter, uh, email, Skype, you know, is the uh, arts, and particularly painting, how are they being changed through all this, you know? And that's how what paint was born.
unlike many other jury shows out there, we don't charge artists any money to uh, submit work. Wet paint is free for the artists. There's no money involved in it. It's all supported by the Joe Brothers. So the show explores both sides of the painting equation. Those who are working with very traditional painting medium versus those who are experimenting. But it's about seeing what is happening now, what is happening, what artists are doing, what communicates, what is exciting about painting. Because painting is a life. When all the work comes in, uh, that is very special for me because we do the selection by looking at everybody's submissions on the monitor. But when you actually open a box and see the actual work, it's like opening a present. Except that you have to return it at the end of the show. I think this show embraces and celebrates what painting has been through many years and what it will be perhaps in the future. Uh, Painting, I think, will always be around. Uh, painting is alive as well as this show kind of promotes it. And as long as there's young people embracing the medium, I think painting will stay forever. I think with painting is one of those shows that it will evolve. So I may not per se right now understand what it will become in the next five years. And I kind of like that, and that's kind of the way I work. I like to see things grow in what it makes sense. And what it makes sense in the future might not make sense right now. So uh, I, I'm excited about what is becoming, and I'm excited about what it could become. So I don't have a name for it yet. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, what has become is now a biennial, and next year will be eight years since uh, since this video of when we started wet paint, so here's your fourth one, fourth tweetable thing I've learned over my last 45 uh, my last 45 years. Turn up the volume of your imagination. You know, sometimes we we imagine we dream too small. You know, if I had dreamed of of taking that opportunity and just doing a show with my friends and calling the people that I knew in Chicago, I wanted something big. You know, I said you know nobody knows me nationally as a curator but I want to do this, and I did it, and took a risk, and it worked. Uh, but sometimes, you know, in this starts in school, you know, you gotta turn up the volume of your imagination, just like when you turn up the volume on your, on your phone, you know, it's sometimes you just have to do it, because otherwise, you know, those ideas that you have will not materialize. So, you know, work over the years, again, has continued to evolve. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy about um, art also that I discovered is kind of this idea of, of almost a performance of, of making art. And now, of course, through, uh, through technology or with the phones and things, you can create a time lapse really quickly of the work that you're doing. So you, you start to document what you do, the process of what you do, because that's a thing that's very special for people to see what you do. So as, as a student, right now you have so many tools that I never had as a student. You know, you can document, you can take pictures of what is it that you make, how you make it. And, uh, you know, this I, I did after, a, actually, a, after a church meeting. I came late from a church meeting, and I went into my studio. I just took two sheets of paper and charcoal, put my phone on the table, and started recording, and made these two pieces that have been to a lot of my shows uh, since then. Um, and, and there's also a sense of, of performance that I've enjoyed too, of making work in front of people. So once, you know, after sometimes looking at this, like, well, maybe I can do this in front of an audience. And there's something about the presence of people that also uh, brings another sense of, of, uh, of, of understanding in the process of art. There's something to be alone in your studio, and then there's something different about, you know, having people looking at what you make. So uh, with expectations that once you finish, you have to make something that, you know, it can be called art in one way or another, right? But uh, so over the years I've now also, every year I do about two or three public performances where, you know, I do it in front of an audience as well. Um, as you see, this was a late night, this was 12.25 p.m. or something like that, um, late night when I did this, uh, these, um, drawings um, 
and my iPhone took the took the shots, took the picture. But something that I learned early on too is that as an artist, you gotta document the process, you gotta document everything that you do. And I have found great value on that over the years because those who come after you, those who will be writing about your art, this documentation that you create, that you organize, that you provide is really golden to them. Dr. Gonzalez, who wrote the book uh, that covers a lot of my artwork, um, that's what you know. That's one of the things, advices, uh, the advice that she gave me. She's like, you have to document what you do because that's very important for those of us who write, who take time to write. So um, that's just part of the process. This here, these are some other paintings. Again, 2011. Uh, there was another big change in my career, also running the gallery and, and through my studio. In 2011, we changed from 33 Collective Gallery to 33 Contemporary Gallery. And what happened is, you know, if there were um, four of us who opened the gallery, right? But only the gallery was the dream of only one of them, which was my dream. You know, that's, that's what I really loved. And so after a while, for some of my friends, they're like, you know what, you know, we like it, but it's, it's work, you know? We don't really enjoy the work <laughs> as much as you do. I'm a workaholic, I like to work. And so instead of you know, having conflict, we're like, you, okay, you know what, let's, the, in, a, in a good way, we finish that. And so then I took ownership of the gallery uh, with my wife, and that's when we rebranded it as what it is right now, 33 Contemporary Gallery. Um, by then also, other international shows began to to happen, I started to do shows outside of the United States and taking artists from Chicago and other places to other countries. Uh, this was a show in Italy and uh, this one one in Vienna, in Mexico, and you know, it, it just started to grow. And But something that I have learned is always, it's always a teamwork. It's never just one person, it's always a teamwork, always working with people. So community and collaboration are one of the things that as an artist, as a student, Something that you really, really need to value in your in your career, because you need each other. You know, you need one another. You are not. You cannot do it all by yourself. You need your professors. You need your advisors. You need your friends to be there with you. In 2012, another big opportunity came for me, and that was uh, to do a collaboration with the city of Chicago. And I came up with this other, and this is another one in which I woke up in the morning and I thought, hey, I have an idea for this show. <laughs> the, uh, I wanted to do. Uh, like select 12 Chicago artists who work with non-conventional materials, recycled materials, repurposed materials, and work with the city of Chicago to put a show at the uh, Garfield Park Conservatory, which is one of the largest conservatories in the United States. And each artist was assigned a section of the conservatory, and they, they created work that coexisted with nature. So using, you know, all steel and materials that are man-made that usually destroy the earth, what if they could take those materials and create something that would be really, really uh, cool and co coexist with, with nature? And that was Chicago's 12 at Garfield Park Conservatory. And it was just a great experience. It was really awesome to working with so many artists uh, and uh, with the community, because then we did open talks, discussions with the people around Garfield Park Conservatory, talking about you know ways in which we can protect the earth, which uh, ways in which we can, um, you know, uh, clean or, or, or carbon footprint a little bit better. And I, through this process, I became friends with many of these artists, artists who I respect as well. And it's just, again, another, another way of collaborating. Um, so over the years, I've discovered that, you know, it's my career, when I look back, it's all about collaboration and working together. In 2012, my wife and I, you know, we decided to also it was time to give back in some way for a lot of what we have been given. So we opened uh, a company that was called 3C Wear, Inspired Clothing to Inspire Giving. And so what we did is we asked uh, Chicago artists and also artists outside of Chicago uh, eventually to design a t-shirt for us. Then we would put the t-shirt for sale. And then with the proceeds, then we would also buy school supplies and give away to kids who didn't have school supplies. So we would go to local schools, uh, and where uh, areas where the kids really needed school supplies. And it was pretty awesome. It was really, really great experience. But something, something really happened there, although it was an amazing thing, and we loved it. Um, there was another big, giant company that we were not aware of, even though you know, our company was legit. We were 3C Ware. There was a company in Europe 
that did all the type of clothing, sports clothing, not even what we did. It was called three. Well, they didn't even have that wasn't the name. They had a sub name that was called Three D Wear with a D, right? They were multi million dollar company. We were we were giving you know pencils and things to kids, little little guys. And so we went through the process of trademarking trademark our name for 3C Wear and all that. So through the process, it takes about you know months, and at the very end of the process, there's a window of time in which any company that has any problem with your name, they can speak out, kind of like speak now or forever, zip it, right? So <laughs> that, that, well, they didn't zip it, <laughs> unfortunately. They came out after us, and they, they had their big lawyers come after us, and they said, you have to stop this. Okay? You cannot use the name. So. Uh, unfortunately, we had to stop 3C Wear, and that you know that that felt like a big defeat for us. You know, it's like man, you know, this is something that we love to do. We be, we work so hard to to put together, and there's these big guys who they know what we're doing. They don't care about the kids. Uh, they, they just care about their name, their brand, and which is not even the same that we have. So, another lesson here, another tweetable moment: success belongs to those who return after the next failure. That is true, and, and failure is not necessarily something that you may do wrong, but sometimes failure is, is just part of the process, and I think as artists, we all understand failure, because when I'm in the studio making art, and I'm sure you do as well, this is some pictures of process, you know, it's about testing and about working things out, and you add something, and you remove it, and you, and, and, and you fail one night and you come back and you get at it again and again and again. But it's, it's that process of coming back after the previous failure that makes the whole thing worthwhile. And that's why I call it, you know, um, that's why I said it's success is, is for those who come after the next failure because they're not after the past one, but the next one because there's always going to be another one. There's always going to be one ahead of us. And and that's the, that's the in the heart of the artist, you know. We, we know this because... We experience this every time we walk in the studio. Uh, I'm sure you do. And my art sometimes starts in the wall, goes in the floor, goes back in the wall. I repainted it, start over again, and you know, until the work is finished and done. And and it is what it is. But what people see you hanging on the wall, they don't see all the tears and all the sweat and all the all the frustrations and failures that you experience in order to get that what people see. Um, over the years, I've been able also to collaborate with artists, and there's also something wonderful and amazing about collaboration, um, and collaborating is, is something that I enjoy doing as well. If I had more time, I, you know, I have a lot of videos that I have done with artists collaborating, but um, you can go to my YouTube channel and you can find them there. I had an opportunity to do a, uh, my first museum show a few years back at the Mex National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago. I think it was 20, I don't remember the year, 2013. Um, and I, was, I had the chance to create a, a work on site. So the big dollar sign that you see right here is a work on site that's specifically made for the museum and for the community of the people in the museum because it's all about that. It's all about um, you know, the dream of a community of coming from a different country, leaving everything behind in order to, you know, to, to look for a better life. So one dollar here spelled in Spanish differently as one, one dolor, which means one pain. You know, this idea that every, every dollar is somebody else's pain. We, uh, as a gallery, we started to also, you know, do what a lot of galleries have to do to survive, which is do international art fairs. We have done that as well. Continue travel and working with other artists as well internationally. And it's just been uh, quite, a, quite a, an, an opportunity to do that. And as, as I start to wrap it up, you know, here's the, uh, the Joby Art Center as it is today, which you are really, really more than welcome to come and check it out. One of the cool things that you have as a school here, and if you choose to come here, if you're a student kind of thinking of maybe coming to Trinity, is that it's so close to a big city. You know, you have opportunities to go, like Professor Baker, who's going to take the students to visit artist studios, you know. You don't find that in every school. That's really hard to find. Here you have opportunity to walk into to places like this, like the Joby Art Center, where you're surrounded by art. We have uh, 50 artists in residence. Uh, last uh, year, we we were working with high school teachers from all the state. We have now host we now host the largest high school art exhibit in the state. 
Last, just last year alone, over $25 million on scholarship money for college was given to kids through that, through that um, effort. So, you know, you have access to all this wonderful life in the city of Chicago. And for me, over the years, you know, since 2014, no, 2004, when, when we opened to what it is now, this is the past show, it's been a learning experience. And working under the direction also in uh, the Joe Brothers who manage the art center, who have now become also international uh, success artists. They have done work for the White House, uh, and they they travel around the world on the you know uh, on the year round they are always traveling and moving their art career. Now what's coming for the future is there's an uh, job art center in Kansas City that's going to open up next year and also another one in Beijing, and you know it's been been fascinating. So here's my number seven, uh, which is nobody grows from good to great without taking higher risks, and you gotta take risks. You know from now to as you go in your art career, you know, you gotta take risk. Art is a risk in itself. If you choose an art career, you know, there's a risk. If you choose, uh, although nowadays I guess in every career <laughs> it's a risk, because nothing guarantees that you're gonna graduate and have a job right away, right? That's the way, that's how the way the world turns out to be. But you gotta take the risk, you know? Don't be afraid of uh, trying and pursuing the dream that you have uh, for your art career. These are some pictures, very recent, of uh, last year of some more exhibitions. And that's the gallery, which you can come and visit us anytime. And the last thing I want to talk about, and with this I'll close, is we started uh, two years ago working with artists and inspiring artists, helping artists really to, to pursue their dreams as artists. So we, uh, we started with a podcast, and every week I uh, have a new podcast episode now. I'm in 122nd, I think. And I interview artists, curators, gallery directors, and other art professionals, and in an, in an effort to inspire artists. And uh, the podcast is downloaded around the world by artists. And so this, we do it together with my wife, who's a psychologist. We started working together and started what we call the Art Next Level, where we you know, help transform artists into entrepreneurs as well, and looking at how, how can I make this career a sustainable one? Yeah, you know, uh, a lot of people say, well, uh, Sergio, art is not about money, but you know what? You need the money to make the art that is not about the money, and that is a true reality. You got to pay bills. You got you to gotta figure out how you're going to make a living, how you're going to sustain yourself. So we have devoted our time to that. So and that's kind of what we do, and we go, through, uh, we go to uh, colleges, universities, and other uh, organizations and kind of spreading the word out, helping artists to really pursue their dreams that they have for their art career. And with this, I'll finish. You know, when I think about influence and, and the influence that we can that we can gain, uh, it's not defined by the number of likes that people put in your Facebook or in your Twitter, but by the private thank yous that you get that nobody sees. That's how, that's what to me is influence. That's what to me it it, it matters. You know, people get like, oh, you have you know, ten thousand followers in Instagram, or they or they have a hundred thousand, or you know, people get fancy with numbers, but at the end of the day, you know, it's the impact that you have on people is the, you know, the likes, the things that nobody sees that really is what, at the end of the day, that matter the most. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I hope that, you know, that you enjoy the work that you'll see in the gallery. I'm here to answer any questions. If there's one thing I want to uh, kind of encourage you today is if you have this call for art, don't put it away. You know, it's something special. You have this giftedness that Tomorrow you can walk into the studio and create something that wasn't there the day before. You know, that's amazing to me. And uh, when we stop making it, it's a gift that we take away to, to humanity. So think about that.